So I would really like to thank the organizers for setting up such a nice meeting. The, the room is really packed. It's really a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, some ongoing work with uh, several colleagues, um, uh, with Gabriel, of course, uh, and uh, other people uh, like Audrey V, Francis Bach, Hélène Chiza, François-Pierre Paty, Isham Janati, and Alexandre Granfort. They, they are all involved in, in, some, uh, in some parts of this talk. And I would like to make a little bit of advertisement for a recent uh, book that we wrote with Gabriel. So if you're interested in, in some of the topics that I will be presenting today, uh, uh, most of the, the discussions are, are in that book. Uh, and so and it's, uh, it's available online on P as a PDF. So uh, since uh, I, I, I gather some of you here might be familiar with Optimal Transport and some may not. So in the previous talk, this was mentioned. So I thought it would be nice to go back to the origins. And the origins, since we are in Paris here, it's essentially uh, more, sorry. And so if you, uh, I mean, I guess half of the lecture room here knows more. Maybe some of you don't. He was a, a very important and decisive French mathematician. And his first merit is probably to have survived the, the, the French Revolution. So this is uh, not something that should be discounted. And he did, of course, several things after the French Revolution. And uh, if, you, if, if you are in Paris here as a tourist or visiting uh, for business for this conference, then you might, for instance, pop up into uh, Place Morge, which is very, very close to here. So uh, the reason why we still refer to Morge in this talk about optimal transfers is because he's the one that set up the, the whole, the, this whole theory and this whole idea. And the way he did so is by writing this memoir in 1781, which starts in French as lorsqu'on doit transporter blah, blah, blah. And if you just summarize this in English, this would be when ha one has to bring Earth from one place to another. And so he starts with a very concrete problem, which is uh, something that you could encounter if you were managing public works. And the most problem is as follows. There is a pile of Earth somewhere that's lying, that's not being used, and you need it. Let's say it's sand. Maybe you need to fill up this hole. And the hole here, we are going to assume it has the same volume. So the pile of sand and the, and the hole have the same volume. And Monge asks, what is the optimal way to do this? In the sense that we want to not spend too much energy on this, on this problem. And of course, in the 21st century, it doesn't sound like a very interesting problem. We just simply shove the entire mass here and just fill it up. We use a big uh, engine. And then we just get rid of this uh, issue. Uh, however, in the, in the 18th century, of course, you must imagine that there were workers there that were doing this manually. And they probably had to bring a shovel, lift some, some earth at some point x. And the density of that earth at point x was mu of x. And then we had to tell them, well, if you pick something at x, you have to bring it somewhere else. And it's at y. And you can imagine that the hole is there, for instance, and you pick up some some sand, and then you will drop it somewhere in one of the Ys that are available to you. And this is a, a map, then, that you need to define for the worker to do his job. And that's simply to say that if you pick x, go to t of x. Now, uh, then you would do this, of course, repeatedly. And each time you do this micro effort, then infinitesimal effort, you're basically traveling the distance between x and t of x. And you're, you can argue that the good notion of work a unit of work for this, of energy, would be the mass that you carry times the distance. Uh, now, if you want to do that, you have to be a bit careful about which t's you're going to consider. And this is a very, there is a very natural con constraint that pops up. If you just give any random t that would be a f function from r to r, then you will not likely fill up this hole, but maybe drop sand <laughs> everywhere else. And so what you need to do is that for every segment b that you consider on the real line, you will basically look at all the sand that comes and reaches B, and that's the inverse of this, the map that you gave the worker. The inverse is the set meaning. And that might be, for instance, let's say you told the worker to take the sand that's at all those segments and bring it at this segment. And then the natural constraint that you have is that basically the entire mass that you gather from all those small sets in the beginning is equal to the, the entire mass or volume that you need here to, to fill up at, in that area. And so if you do this for several Bs, basically you get this very natural constraint that for any B, the mass of the inverse uh, image of B is equal to the mass of the target at B. Okay? And we write this mathematically by just saying that the push forward of the map T uh, uh, when acting on mu must be equal to nu. Now, of course, you can then 
define this problem, and the problem that people call the Morse problem nowadays is essentially finding this map such that the push forward condition uh, constraint is, is uh, ensured that minimizes this interval. So this, of course, has been generalized a lot. Now we are playing with measures that live in measurable spaces with any cost function, not necessarily a distance, any two probability distributions. And then you can very simply write this problem as the, the more generic Morse problem. What's very nice, I mean, it's interesting is that for two centuries there was not much advance on this topic until basically Brunier came up with a beautiful theorem. In eight, nine, so this is 1781, this is 1987. Uh, so two centuries later. So if omega is Rd and the cost is the squared Euclidean distance, so it's, so it's a bit different than Moore's cost. Moore's was just a distance. Then, uh, and then to just simplify the, the argument, if mu and u are absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then the optimal transport that maps mu to nu is necessarily the gradient of a convex function. So if you ever define, if you find a function that's convex, u, and compute its gradient, and it happens to transport this to this, then it's necessarily the, the optimal transport. Now, this perspective is beautiful, but as I will argue now, it's not always that useful in a machine learning or data science world. And the reason is, is very simple, is that this doesn't really work in many cases when you are dealing with data. And uh, the first thing that you can argue for is that the problem is not convex. It's not convex because a set of uh, maps t that are pushed forwards from mu to nu is not a convex one. So first, that's a bit of a hurdle if you want to use this, uh, if you want to compute this. And the second point, which is often uh, referred to, is that in many cases, when your measures are discrete, and this is what statisticians deal with, then there is not always a, uh, a, a push forward that maps one measure to another. And here it's trivial to see that if you push forward a Dirac mass at x, you can only get a Dirac max on the, mass on the right side. And so there's no way you will find a push forward map that will give you this. So what we need is something that's a bit more blurry. Maybe I'm not going to say that whenever you pick some mass at x, you have to bring it at one point. I'm going to allow myself some blurriness. And this is the idea of the uh, Kantorovich relaxation. So historically, the, if you go back to the roots of optimal transport, there's several names that are associated with this idea. But Kantorovich is the one that people give uh, the most credit to. So there's Tolstoy and Hitchcock. Uh, so the idea is, instead of going from x to t of x, the first relaxation proposed is to say, well, actually, I might sprinkle around some of the mass that I'm picking at x. And I'm going to consider this, if you want, conditional distribution, probability distribution, which would say, if you pick mass at x, then the amount of x uh, of mass, you, you could basically distribute it following this distribution. Okay, something that's a bit more blurry. And if you actually work out this formulation, what you realize that is that you're actually optimizing not so much on those conditional distributions, because that's not so important. What you're actually optimizing on is on couplings. So probability couplings. So you have omega is your base space. You're going to consider couplings on the product space of omega with itself. And then what you're going to look at is essentially couplings that have the first marginal set to mu and the second marginal set to nu. So let me just visualize this. Suppose that omega here is the real line. We have a probability distribution mu, another probability distribution nu. Here is such a valid coupling. It's easy to see that if you push the mass in this direction, you recover mu. And if you push the mass, push the mass sorry, in this direction, you recover nu. And an interesting fact is that there is always a coupling that you can build that has two marginals mu and nu, whatever the, 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 the marginals are. You can always take the product of those two marginals. So there's always a coupling that's valid. And so here, for instance, there, there's another one. This is the one that I just picked here, just a product of those marginals. This one is a bit different. It, th those are two mixtures of Gaussians. And here there's a way to, to come up with a different coupling that's not just this product of couplings. And now the Morse problem is, sorry, the Kontorovich problem is instead of looking at this cost between x and t of x, so this is the you want the deterministic way of doing transport. The Kantorovich one is just, let's be a bit blurry. For every mass at x, you're going to send it around at many y's. But I'm going to integrate the cost between all those x's and y's that the transport is putting mass on. Okay? So this joint coupling is what we call transport. And uh, the reason also why people give credit to, 
to, to Kantorovich for starting this field is because he's the one that actually, for the first time, uncovered duality in this optimal transport problem. The optimal transport problem, it's easy to see that it's a linear program where we only have marginals that are basically linear constraints and an objective which is a linear, linear function of p. Well, you can show that this linear program has a dual. And the, as usual with a dual, the dimension here of the variable of the primal becomes the dimension of the constraints in the dual. And here the dimension of, uh, sorry, the, the constraints in the primal becomes the, the, the number of variables in the dual. So you have this uh, formulation that people usually call the Kantorovich formulation. And people call those five and size the Kantorovich potentials. So let me just close this a bit mathematical overview by just saying that the reason we hear the name Wasserstein is because if the cost is indeed a distance to the power p, then you can show that this quantity, which was for the first time introduced to the Western audience by Wasserstein in the 60s, is a distance. So the Kantorovich problem with a cost that's a, that's a distance to power p, then you compute the Kantorovich problem, you take 1 over p here, then you have the Wasserstein distance. And to simplify things and get rid of this 1 over p here, we often just consider the Wasserstein p to the power p distance. And let me just conclude this overview by saying that there's one very specific case, and I'm going back, I'm really circling back now to Morge. And it's something that Morge hadn't seen, which is that when you define that the cost here is the distance itself, p equals 1, then you can show that actually this, this problem and the dual simplify to something that's very nice, which is that you're basically looking for the supremum over all five functions that are one Lipschitz of the difference between mu and u. And this is a link with some so-called integral probability metrics for, for probability distributions. So why do people get excited about optimal transport in, in applications? Well, it's because it defines a very nice geometry to compare probability distributions. And this was something that people started realizing in the 90s in the, in the, in the math community. So here is a simple example. Suppose you have those two mixtures of Gaussians. We are living in this space of probability distributions. Well, the Wasserstein distance is a geodesic distance on this space of probability distributions. People call this very often the Wasserstein space. And because it's a geodesic distance, basically you can compute interpolations between probability distributions. And this, is, this was highlighted by McCann in the 90s. And what you can see is that what it, this is essentially showing is that you can go from this distribution to this distribution by moving the mass from left to right a bit. And then you will see those shapes that you know, those mountains and hills that will kind of morph and go back again to look like this one. And I would like to contrast this with the usual interpolation, linear interpolation that we use in machine learning in most applications. And that's this one. So if you have, you're starting, for instance, with this blue measure and you're comparing it to this red measure. So suppose this, for instance, is a sensor that's sensing temperatures at some point. And very close, you have another sensor that's sensing those temperatures. How would you combine those two sensors? That's called data fusion. Well, one simple approach, very, very, I mean, direct, would be to take the average, the Euclidean average between those two distributions. And that's just simply playing this elevator game where you're giving more or less weight to one of the two distributions. But the only way they can interact is basically by taking those linear combinations. So the Wasserstein, in the Wasserstein world, in the optimal transport world, we don't do this like in vertically, we rather do this laterally. Like we're really actually playing on the <coughs> space on which the distributions are supported. And this is how you get those interpolations. And you can start playing with this. And actually, if in the univariate case, this way of averaging is, is quite well known. It's related to averaging the quantile functions. So here you can see how you can average those three distributions. But what's exciting and fun is to play with 3D images, for instance, or 3D shapes. And you can, you can see uh, interpolations, which don't really make sense as in the previous talk, in the sense that there is no, not much involved here. We're just using the Euclidean distance between points to define the optimal transport distance. And then we're just plotting whatever we get. And it seems to be doing something that's reasonable in many cases. But there are also some failure cases that you can come up with. And, uh, so I don't want to oversell this as, a, as an ultimate way to, to interpolate between shapes. Uh, but it, it kind of works in some applications. I mean, at least we, we observe that. 
So that's one example, and this ha had some success in, in the graphics community. But the other reason people like Wasserstein distances is because they believe they can be used to compare things that are very badly behaved. And let me give you an example from the GAN, the Generative Adversarial Network Literature. In the GAN world, what we like to do is to use data in a very high dimensional space, let's say images of dimension 100 times 100. And those are points. Each point here would be an image. And what we like to do is to generate images. And the way we generate images is by taking a small vector of coordinates that can be sampled, let's say, uniformly from a small hypercube, then applying a function and looking at what so you can imagine that you have a function, that this is typically a deconvolution ne neural network, that takes a vector of 100 numbers and outputs an image of 100 times 100 uh, and three color channels dimensions. So it's a very degenerate situation because you're effectively basically taking a, something that's full here in a low dimension and mapping it to some kind of manifold through this function of theta. And now your goal in this GAN literature is to make this manifold fit in a way, to those observations that you have. He, here, each point is, is an image. And so what you are uh, actually aiming for is making sure this push forward of this mu latent space measure in the space of images somewhat looks like your database of images. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of those GANs, you know, the faces that they reconstruct and everything. Well, it's important to note that the Wasserstein distance was very useful in this, in this context, and there's, a very, uh, there's a ve various algorithms that have been proposed on this idea of trying to minimize the Wasserstein distance between this manifold and the, and, 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 and the blue measures. And if you didn't have the Wasserstein distance, it's not obvious what other measures of uh, similarity or distance you could use. There, are, there have been a few. But none of the obvious choices, just like Euclidean distance or uh, kullback library divergence that we like in statistics to compare probability distributions would work here. Uh, now, I will... I'm not going to uh, get too much into the details of all the examples that you can come up that where transport has been used, but let me just single out a few. So in statistics, people like this idea of distributionally robust optimization, where instead of minimizing a risk with respect to a data measure, like the ERM, empirical risk minimization principle, you're actually giving yourself a bit of robustness, and you're looking for distributions of data that might be not too far from you, what you gave me, and you can try to measure this in Wasserstein sense. So there's a string of papers on this topic. It has also been used in NLP to compare word embedding measures of word embeddings. So for those of you who may not uh, be familiar with those advances, recently the, the, the dominant way to look at a word is to embed it in a very high dimensional space. Well, not so high, but maybe 100 or 200 or 300. And then you can see a text as a point cloud in dimension 200. And then you try to compare two uh, texts by comparing those two distributions in this space of dimension 200. And optimal transport has been used a lot in this, in this context. Uh, there is some recent work that's very exciting that uh, I think Hisham is in the room. Uh, yes, he's there. <laughs> so if you are interested in looking at optimal transport and applications of optimal transport to neuroimaging, Hisham is the guy. So we have been working on, on some uh, uh, nice developments here. And then there is a... Um, also, if you, if you would like to see what optimal transport can be used in, in like every, uh, not everyday tasks, but advanced tasks, I would like to advertise a bit a recent paper that was published in, in Cell by a team of researchers at MIT and the Broad Institute. And one of them here is a colleague, Philippe Rigolet. There's, there's, of course, it's a biology paper that has 20 names. But one of them is a statistician. And the first one is also someone in machine learning. And so what they did is essentially try to reconstruct the evolution of cells uh, across days. Uh, basically, it's iPS cells that go back to, uh, to specialize into different types of cells. And they use basically optimal transport as a toolbox. And actually, they use the, the, the unbalanced optimal transport uh, uh, tool uh, developed by Lenaik and Gabriel here uh, to, uh, to, to, to basically reconstruct the trajectories of those cells in, 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 uh, when they, they go from a, a regular cell to an iPS cell. So all of this brings me to the slide where I'm basically saying that it's a fairly hot topic right now. It's used across several disciplines. If you really look at the literature, you will notice that um, in 
the data science world up to 2010, the obsession was let's try to compute optimal transport quickly or let's try to bound it, maybe give an upper bound very quickly so that we can discard maybe in the nearest neighbor search some, some, some items. Um, what is interesting is that in, in data sciences, when we use optimal transport, we're transitioning to something that mathematicians did about 20 years ago, which is to look at more as a function that's a loss. So if you want to fit a probability distribution to some target, use the Wasserstein time distance as a loss. And this, some of the applications that I showed earlier really fit into this framework. So the Wasserstein GAN1 is exactly about trying to find a parameterized distribution that looks like your data and play with this. And I'm saying this go, dates back to 20 years in, the, in, in, in math, because the, f the first really steps in this direction, you can see them in this paper by uh, Otto and, and co-authors, and there's also a lot of work, of course, by Ambrosio and co-authors uh, on trying to define a proper meaning of what would be a gradient with respect to one of the two measures of this Wasserstein distance. So there is this book on, on gradient flows in metric spaces, and particularly in the Wasserstein space, which gives a lot of inspiration for a lot of the, the, the works that I've just described. So this is all exciting. Now for the really bad news, because I think uh, we have to ponder exactly why we want to use this tool. It's when you use something in machine learning, usually you want two things. One of them is that what you're doing is mildly efficient computationally. And the other thing is that it somewhat makes sense statistically. We never really have access to the full probability distributions we're playing with. We're always sampling them, either because you're measuring them or maybe you have a sampler that will sample from, from, a, from a given density in high dimensions. So you have to ask yourself, what happens if I have two sets of points and I want to compare those two samples? And first, how much do I need in terms of energy to compute this? And the other thing is, what happens? Does this basically concentrate very quickly around the Wasserstein distance, the true Wasserstein distance? If I look at the samples, does this look anything at all like this quantity? And for both of those aspects, which are important in machine learning, the answer is quite negative. So let me just start with computations. So I want to transport this point cloud to this point cloud. I have a point cloud here with has, which has masses, weights, and uh, points x size. I have a point cloud or a discrete measure with masses bj's and points yj's. And I want to compute the optimal transport between those two. So the good news is that I can use directly the definition that was given by Kantorovich. I can use it as it is. And if I just write it down, what I will see appearing is first, I will need to compute the distance between all my points, all the xi's and all the yj's. And that's basically absorbing all of the geometry of the problem. And then I will need to account for those marginals, okay, for those, those, the couplings, the space of couplings that I need to discretize. And in this case, it boils down to something simple, which is all matrices of size m times m that have marginals a and b's, row sums a and column sums b's. And then what I get is this canonical optimal transport problem. I'm saying canonical because it's, it's the first linear program that was arguably investigated and solved in the 40s by, by, by all the, the mathematical programming community at that time, of course, with, starting with Tanzig. So you have this, this linear problem, linear constraints, linear objective, and this has been known for 70 years now. And um, let me give you a geometric perspective. We are living in a space of n times m matrices. This is the cost vector. This is a set of feasible matrices that have the right marginals. And what I'm looking for is to compute this P star. So the good or bad depends on your, your perspective, but probably bad from a, from a computational, I mean, a, applied world, is that this is a very specific instance of linear program for which we have very efficient algorithms, but still, they are cubic in the size of the inputs. So if you have 1,000 points on each side, the bounds that we have are basically 1 billion operations. And I'm saying there's another bad news because this is also very not well posed in terms of uh, optimization. In the sense that you can very easily see that if I'm starting to use the Wasserstein distance as a uh, loss, I will start playing with x or y's. I will make some modifications to my measures. 
And then this means that, for instance, if I play with the, the points, x or y, you might get this phenomenon where, OK, I'm wiggling a little bit my cost vector. And at some point, it's orthogonal to a, to a facet. This never really happens when you actually implement this. You will never have usually an infinity of, uh, of, of, of solutions. But wh what happens is, of course, is that the, the optimal solution basically jumps around. And this means that the Wasserstein distance, when you compare it between two discrete measures, is not a differentiable quantity in the inputs. Okay? It's neither differentiable in the a's, in the weights, nor in the points x and y's. So that's a bit of a problem. Okay? Now, let me go to statistics. There's a lot of work on this topic as well. And it's related to, uh, to optimal quantization errors. And just to, there's several hypotheses that you can make on the measures to kind of narrow down and uh, get sharper results. But let me just say that it's, it's widely admitted that when you are in RD and you're using the square Euclidean distance or sometimes square Euclidean distance to power P, you get bounds of the type that this quantity is basically of the order of n to the power 1 over d. Sorry, 1 to the power of n power 1 over d. So it's extremely slow. You need an exponentially large number of samples in dimension to get a valid approximation of your distance. And there's been a lot of work recently that try to narrow down this type of constant. So for instance, there's been very nice work by John, John Weed uh, with, uh, and, and, co and co authors on different assumptions you might make. For instance, the densities are smooth, or maybe the, the densities are supported on a very small, low dimensional manifold, and you have things like that, but it's not clear that they always play an important role in practice. So, to cool down a bit the interest for this, there's two things that really don't seem to fit you know, what we need in machine learning, which is that this is super costly and it's very bad statistically. So when you see that, either you give up on optimal transport or you think about regularizing the problem. There's some way we need to come up with a way to control a bit uh, you know, the freedom that we have in all this, this optimal transport problem. And so I'm going to talk about two recent results. I mean, a few results first uh, about regularization, uh, a few ways this was tackled in the past, and come up with two ideas and present two ideas in the, in the rest of the time that I have. So we start with uh, the dual. So the dual problem is clearly something that you can try somewhat to regularize. You could try, for instance, to say, OK, instead of looking for potentials phi and psi that are arbitrary, I'm going to restrict to some well-behaved potentials. So they might be in RKHS. I might try to somewhat dualize, regularize this constraint. And then you have something that we proposed a couple of years ago with, with uh, Gabriel Aude and, uh, and Francis. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. Then you can also look back. You remember I told you that there is one case where the Wasserstein distance simplifies to the super or Lipschitz functions. Well, what you can try to do is somewhat take a subset of those Lipschitz functions. And this was the idea that people used in this uh, wasserstein gan paper. They basically said, OK, if what we want is a super member of Lipschitz functions of this integrating against the difference of those two measures, let's just restrict our space of functions to deep neural networks with re re rectified linear units with bounded weights. And that gives me a Lipschitz function. And then I'm going to do stochastic gradient descent to optimize this. That, that, that was the idea. Well, you can argue that this is not really going to approach optimal transport at all, because this is not even a convex procedure. But still, it's a very nice idea to somewhat use a bit, inspire, get inspiration from more. And then there's other approaches that can work if you are in a low dimensional space using wavelets and things like that. So these this were some uh, previous contributions. Now let me just focus back on the primal problem. The primal problem, there's plenty of things we can try to do. What you can try to do is play with the cost to make things a bit better behaved. So there were, there were some ideas in, in, in about 10 years ago, and they were very successful in practice. They were basically saying, let's uh, threshold the cost. Let's, uh, whenever it's bigger than 1, we just say it's 1. And then we just run the LP as it is. And then in that case, you can show that the LP is actually faster and much easier to compute. There's other approaches which, again, rely on this Wasserstein 1 idea. And in this case, can be applied, for instance, to compute uh, geodesic, uh, uh, sorry, optimal transport on graphs, where the distance is a geodesic distance on the graph. 
shortest path, shortest path distance. And this is a bit related to the W1 approach that I just uh, introduced earlier. And the link here is very clear with those references by Beckman. And this was used more in data sciences. Now, you could start doing something different, which is let's look at the measures and play with them. So one possible approach is let's do k-means, for instance. I'm going to go from a endpoint measure to something that's much smaller, that's reduced by using, first doing a quantization step. And this is a fairly good idea. And this was uh, proposed by Kanas and Rosasco a couple of years ago. You could, for instance, look at Gaussians. Let's say, OK, forget about my measure. I'm just saying I'm just computing maximum likelihood Gaussian on that measure, and then comparing the two Gaussian distributions. I'm going to detail a bit this. You could project on random lines. So this was the idea by Julien Rabin and co-authors, including Gabriel. And recently, what we have been proposing is in, rather than just projecting on one random on of various random lines, let's try to look for k-dimensional subspaces. So I will present this idea. And finally, what you can do is add regularization to the transport plan, the coupling itself. And this has been a fairly fertile source of uh, ideas. And one regularization that stands out a bit is entropic regularization. And I will, I will describe this very quickly. So I'm going to try to give an overview of those three ideas. Gaussians, because I think it's important to know about this. This k-dimensional subspace, which is a fairly new idea. And entropic regularization, which maybe some of you know already, but I'm going to, 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 to describe a bit this. Um, so when you, compute, when you compare two uh, Gaussians, what you need to know is that basically the distance has a closed form that only depends on the means and the, and the covariance matrices. And this was recently, I'm going to skip this. This was recently introduced and used a lot in the GAN literature. Maybe some of you might have heard about the fresh inception distance. Well, you ha if you haven't, well, just think that basically what people do in the GAN literature to compare GANs, the performance of GANs, is that they look at the two Gaussians of some intermediate layer of uh, embeddings and then compute the vast distance between those two Gaussians. So it's, it's an important result. So for univariate distances, this is something that statisticians are very familiar with. Well, computing the Wasserstein distance in this nice, well-behaved case where you're looking at a cost that is translation invariant and convex function of that translation invariant uh, cost, then the only thing that you need to do is look at the quantile functions of the two measures and then integrate this cost over the difference between the quantile functions. So as a cartoon, you have this measure, this measure, you compute the two CDFs, you inverse the CDFs, that gives you the quantile functions, and then you just integrate the sum of the costs of those lengths here. And uh, this gave rise to another way to regularize optimal transport, which is the idea of slicing the Wasserstein distance. And the idea of slicing the Wasserstein distance is just simply projecting the measures on random lines and just averaging this when you're projecting on different uh, lines on the sphere. Now, this introduces this next contribution, which is now, rather than just looking at one random line, we could look at a subspace. And actually, a lot of people have done this by, looking, by using basically PC, PCA. So in the, the, in the optimal transport application to biology that I just described, what people were doing is they take, let's say, all the points in dimension 5,000, do a PCA, reduce all the points to dimension 30, and then do optimal transport on that uh, lower dimensional space. What we have been investigating is, let's use a more robust perspective. Rather than taking PCA, which is essentially trying to capture where the action happens, let's look at something which will couple this idea of capturing where the action happens with the Wasserstein distance. So we're going to look at the projection matrix on the dimensional, or lower dimensional space, subspace, which maximizes the Wasserstein distance between the two projections. So the idea is, imagine that you have your two measures. You know, they live in a high dimensional space. I'm going to project them on this subspace. And I'm going to look for this subspace that maximizes the Wasserstein distance between those two sets of points. Now, it turns out that this approach is very well motivated in theory. And uh, this is, those results are not even really published, I think. They were presented last week at a workshop. But basically, they indicate that if really your measures are living on a low dimensional subspace, and then there's some noise that you add to them, 
then you recover a very nice statistical estimator by doing this max here. The problem is that this is not convex. And so you might ask, OK, this is the max mean. It's not convex. What happens with the min max? Well, the min max is convex. And this is what we have been looking for and played with uh, uh, François-Pierre Paty. So the idea is that you can show that essentially the min max corresponding to this maximum problem boils down to an eigenvalue problem, which involves what we call this VP. VP is when you give you a transport plan, you compute a second order moment matrix of the transportation plan, basically saying if x is associated to a y, I'm going to compute the tensor product of that vector, displacement vector with itself, and I'm going to add it up. And then you can rephrase this problem here as minimizing over all p's in the, in, in the set of uh, um, in the couplings that which has the largest sum of top k eigenvalues. And if for k you take k is equal to dimension, we recover exactly the optimal transport problem. If you give yourself a subspace of dimension d when d was your original dimension, it's the same thing. But now if you're looking for a lower dimensional subspace, what you need to do is basically look at the eigenvalues of this second order moment matrix. So I'm going to skip those examples. What I'm essentially, what we showed in, the, in this paper with François Pierre is that you, you can actually capture a bit like PCA, you know, when you see those elbow curves in PCA that look at the variance depending on how many directions you project your data on. We can actually capture the effective dimension of two measures by looking at basically the, the way this, uh, this uh, projected subspace or, or subspace robust Wasserstein distance evolves as you increase the number of uh, dimension scale. Now, I have a very few minutes to introduce entropic regularization, so I'm going to be very, very fast. Uh, but I hope I will convey the main message. So another way to regularize, I told you, you know, you could play with the costs, you could play with the measures by projecting them, etc. One way you could also play with this optimal transport problem is essentially by regularizing the, op the, the optimal transport plan. And this was the first thing that somewhat Kantorovich was doing. He went from a Monge map that was deterministic to something that's a bit fuzzy, which is those probability distributions. And what we want to do is go beyond that. We want to get something that's OK with a transportation plan that may not be a vertex of this polytope, but that you can get in a much faster and more uh, efficient algorithm. And the idea dates back to some work by economists in the 60s. And it's essentially to regularize the optimal transport problem with entropy. So here I'm saying entropy because entropy is, here we're playing with a coupling, which is a probability distribution on this uh, product space. And so entropy is, is well defined in this case. And so if you just add this entropy, what you're essentially doing is you're asking from the optimal transport to become blurrier and blurrier. So let me be a bit more precise. Here you have two probability distributions, each of them has, let's say, about 100 bins. If you compute the optimal transport plan, it's a matrix of size 100 times 100, which is very sparse. And actually, if you really look carefully, you see something like a Monge map popping up there. When you start adding this entropy regularizer, you're asking more entropy, right? Because it's minus entropy. And then what you see is that you want to have a transportation plan that is blurrier and blurrier. And the reason why this is a nice uh, regularizer is because essentially you can define a very efficient algorithm to get this for you, to get this point here. And this comes from just first order conditions. It's a, it's a very classic result. But let me just say that essentially to recover this P gamma, this regularized optimal transport, instead of running a, a simplex network simplex solver, what you would do is just do two lines of code where you multiply a matrix by a vector. So the way this would happen is basically, I'm going to go through this. The only thing that you need to do is the following. You just define the metric, the distance of uh, all distances, the matrix of all distances, compute the kernel associated to that metric uh, here. Here it's an element-wise exponential. So in this matrix K, you have somewhat everything that defines the geometry between your points X and Y. And then you start with a vector U that you randomly <coughs> assign, or a vector V here. And you do those two updates. And this is called Sinkhorn's algorithm. Okay? You will just normalize a matrix such as this. It has the row sums that you need and the column sums that you need. 
And there's been a flurry of activity on this synchron algorithm in recent years. So the reason we name it synchron is because synchron was the first to prove that this converges. And then there's been a lot of work on trying to get this to work faster. So uh, I don't know if Alessandro is here today, but he's been involved in some very recent work uh, with Jason Altrula, Alessandro Rudi, and Francis Bach on trying to use uh, low rank approximations for this matrix K. We have done our share of work to show that this can be cast as a convolution, et cetera, et cetera. Now, okay, this is an animation that I'm going to skip. And I'm going to simply say, I think I'm reaching my time, so I need to just, okay, I'm probably going to skip everything. And just to tell you that there is a, this synchronous algorithm is essentially a very efficient algorithm to help you reach this intermediate solution here. And the way you actually program it is just a bunch of iterations that you, where you just need to instantiate a kernel and then do a recursion. And if you look at this, those formulas, they're simple enough that you can actually very easily back propagate through those iterations with respect to any of your parameters. So this gives you a loss and this was a bit of uh, initial motivation for, the, for my talk. It's a loss that is differentiable and that mimics the Wasserstein distance. So let me just conclude this talk. I'm sorry for going quickly over the entropy part, but uh, I, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this work. So the optimal tr transport toolbox is a mathematical goldmine. I really believe there's amazing ideas that were produced 20 years ago and up to now by mathematicians. The only thing that we need to be careful, of course, is when you try to use it in practice, I really think it's doomed if you want to use it directly on high dimensional data for some of the reasons that I get, just gave you. It doesn't scale with respect to the number of samples. It doesn't scale uh, in a statistical sense. Uh, so the one thing that you want to do is to regularize it. What's interesting is that usually algorithms come a bit earlier than statistics. And what we're seeing is now statistics catch up a bit with respect to algorithms. So all those entropic regularization works were proposed a couple of years ago. And now we're starting to understand what kind of trade-offs they involve in statistics. And this is audio based work. I wasn't able to present it today, but if you're interested, this is the, the type of reference you should look at. Another very exciting thing is we see applications pop up in several areas. And one of them, not the, one of the most exciting to me is this application to biology where there is a cell journal that, whose title starts with optimal transport recovers uh, differentiation pathways of cells. So it's a, it's a nice achievement, I, I guess, for mathematics to see uh, 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 such prestigious uh, 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 journals publish uh, works with, with mathematic keywords in the title. And uh, there's also, of course, many other very interesting connections that I didn't have the time to, to discuss here with statistics and, uh, and, and, and between the Wasserstein space and, and statistics. Uh, there's Langevin Monte Carlo. Uh, uh, Francis will be talking about, uh, again about the optimal transport in, in his lecture on Friday. So thank you very much, and sorry for going a little bit. Thank you. OK, thank you. Is there some questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I have a question about the synchron distance. So yeah. let's say we have a um, parametric, like a family of measures which are parameterized by theta. Yes. And then we want to minimize the distance between mu theta and nu. Yes. And the distance is Wasserstein yes. in the first case. And let's yes. say in the second case is the synchron distance. Yes. So yes. do we know how, like what changes in the optimality? So like, does it affect the optimal solution? Um, like well, we it, it, will, it will clearly affect the optimal solution. And my, I mean, the main message of my talk here is if you really do things in practice, you should never try to minimize the true Wasserstein distance mm -hmm. because it, it won't make sense. It will basically be very badly behaved in terms of sample complexity. So you'd rather regularize this in some way. And it's either using the synchron regularization or in the Wasserstein Gantt paper by just looking at a, sub, a subset of one Lipschitz functions, you have to somewhat control a bit the, 
okay. the complexity of this. Yeah. Okay. I have a second question. Yes. So do we do we have an <coughs> do we have an idea of what kind of topology this entropic regularized Wasserstein distance induces? So does it imply some weak convergence or like uh, the other things that Wasserstein distance imply? Yes, it would imply the weak convergence. The thing is that there is it's it's just something a subject that's been touched upon. And there is a very nice paper by Gabriel Jean Fedi and many authors that he's going to publish. Uh, he's going to present at AI Stats later this uh, this month. So th basically, the Syncorn trick was something to speed up optimal transport. Uh, defined as it is, and the way I presented it, it's not perfect. It doesn't. It's not equal to zero, for instance, if you compare a measure with itself. But if you modify it a bit, then things seem to be working out the way we want them. So it's convex. I mean, in some cases, it goes to zero if you kind of subtract, do some kind of polarization. There's a way you can work around this. Maybe uh, is our last question, because afterwards we have to clear the room. <laughs> um, I, I see some, some link between the two measures and the coupling with the notion of copula. In, yes. uh, in statistics. Yes. And uh, there has been a lot of work uh, trying to find the maximum entropy uh, joint distribution from, from the marginals. And uh, one of my PhD students had worked uh, on, on that subject. And uh, the, the, there is also some link with tomography, actually, yes. computer tomography. Yes. So the, the thing is, copulas work for univariate distributions, usually. And so one of the main challenges in this framework is to go high dimensional. This is the real uh, for. So in the, in the, there's, there's two different worlds, I would like to say, between transport and univariate case, where things kind of work out statistically, and they work out also computationally, and you can be quite ambitious. And then when you start hitting like dimension two or three immediately, things seem to be going uh, more problematic. So this is where really we need to insist on regularizing. Okay, so let's send the speaker again.